All right, gang. So when we're looking at trends in atomic properties and things we can predict from electron configurations, let's look at this first. I uh, guess we already know it from a basic perspective, what I taught you a long time ago. Uh, and what I taught you in the beginning of the semester was everything wanted to be the noble gas, right? So metals over here, they'd lose enough electrons to be like the noble gas. Non-metals would gain enough electrons, right? So you can go, oh, okay, phosphorus would be a one minus three. You know, uh, magnesium would lose two to get there to become isoelectronic with it. Well, we can look at that now in terms of electron configurations. And then we can look at things that are a little more challenging that go beyond that predictive ability. So we're going to look at four classes here. S block metals, all right? These babies not including hydrogen. So these are your alkali metals and alkaline earth metals or main group type A representative. We're going to look at P block metals, a little bit different, right? So those are metals over here like your tin and your indium and, you know, gallium, those kinds of things. Even some not, some metalloids acting as metals we could put in that situation. So a little bit slightly different rule. I'm just a little fine tuning there. But those are also your representative, you know, or main group elements, um, what we I call type A. We're going to look at nonmetals, of course. That's all your babies over here. So those are, of course, P-block um, uh, representative or main group elements. Very different rules for that one. And then tr we will attempt a basic look, not a detailed look, but a very, very simplified version of the D-block metals. We're not going to do F-block, but we'll look at these transition metals, which are the type of B that I called um, metals or, and, or your D-block. So we'll look at metals specifically, S, P, and D-block, how we treat them differently, and then non-metals. Let's start with the easy one, the S-block metals. Let's go. All right, so for S-block metals, and again, these are your alkali metals and your alkali earth metals, right? The group 1A, group 2A, alkaline, alkaline earth metals and alkaline metals. The goal, what happens is they will always lose their valent shell electrons. The highest end level, remember that's the valence shell, that's the one involved in chemistry and we'll do look at bonding later. That oh, There's no exceptions to that, right? At least for a natural situation. Of course, if we have a big enough laser, we can do weird things. And the purpose for this, like I said before, it was to become isoelectronic with the closest noble gas, which is the prior one, so they would lose enough electrons to do that. Well, why is that? Well, it's because a noble gas electron configuration has a complete outer shell. That is a very, very stable uh, electron configuration that all the elements are trying to achieve. They love having full shells, you know, and if they can't have that, maybe we'll find out with the D elements later. Uh, half shells are pretty, pretty awesome as well. Um, so they want to have that. And, and so in essence, they become isoelectronic with the closest, in this case, prior noble gas element. That would give them a full outer shell. Let's look at it in terms of electron configuration. So we'll do a couple examples. Look at the electron configuration. I'll use orbital box diagrams and the noble gas core shortcut configuration. We'll look at the, um, the neutral atom by itself. And then we'll look at what happens when it loses all of its valence electrons. Let's see what the electron configuration is of the ion. Oh. All right, these are pretty straightforward. We're st I'm starting with the easiest and going to the hardest, I think, is what we're going to do. So again, let's do the orbital um, uh, box diagrams in the noble gas core configuration because we don't care about the core electrons here. So for example, barium. If you look at barium, all right, bariums are right there, element 56, baby. Right, so the prior noble gas to barium, if you look here, is xenon. So we look across the xenon, right, number 54, barium's there. So barium would need to lose two electrons to become like xenon. So barium has the noble gas core of xenon plus n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, s, 2. So xenon 6s2, one electron spin up, one electron spin down. There you go. So that's for the neutral barium. Now barium would love, 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 love to have a complete valent shell to become, be like Mike, right? It wants to be like xenon. So it would have to lose these. So it's going to lose the valence electrons, both of them, and in the process becomes barium 2+. plus. So this is how you can do electron configurations for ions. You just figure out 
what electrons go buh bye Pretty easy to predict, right? Uh, so you'll end up with xenon in an empty 6s, which means it's just xenon. So it's isoelectronic with xenon. That's why barium always forms a plus 2 charge. No exceptions. Nice, huh? Well, I want you to do something for me. Do potassium the same way. Do neutral potassium and do neutral calcium. Pretty sure you already know the answer. And then draw, figure out what electrons are lost and why. Because I'd like you to be able to explain why on an exam. And then give me the, the ions and the electron configuration for the ion. So pause it. Do potassium and calcium for me. You got it? All right. So I will walk through this real quick. So let's find potassium is number 19. Potassium is number 19. So argon's the one prior to it. So it has a gas core of argon. And then potassium's in row one, two, three. It's in the fourth energy level right there. Can you see it? So that'll be 4s2, 4s1. So that has one electron in there. Right? Yep. So one electron in there. Boop. It would love to get rid of that, right? So let's figure out what happens. So let's lose this electron. Remember, these lose all valence electrons, which are always in the S block. So it's either going to lose one or two. So we lose one. So that'll be potassium with a plus one charge. And then we'll end up with an empty 4S, correct? So we'll have the argon with an empty 4S subshell which we can just write as argon. And that's why potassium and all the alkali metals form a plus one. Hydrogen's not considered an alkali metal, but it only has one electron to lose, so it can form a plus one. So it's kind of stuck there, right? Um, but a lot of people will put hydrogen right up there. So don't consider hydrogen an alkali metal. But they're always plus one. That's why they're group 1A. We love trends. Now, barium and calcium are in the same. There's calcium. They're barium. They're in the same group. So we would expect the same chemistry. Alkaline earth metals, group 2A. Okay, so let's take a look at calcium. Calcium's number 20. And the noble gas prior to that is also argon, right? So it's going to be very similar. So let's put the argon. And that's 4s, right? 1, 2, 3, 4s, 2 this time. So we got two electrons in there. So it's almost similar to potassium, but very different because it's got two valence electrons. So this is exactly like barium. That's why Mendeley put these in the same column because they have the same chemical behavior. And when Henry Moseley did it in terms of atomic number, they just fell into the same column. It made so when Henry Moseley did that based on atomic number, everything really made sense. And he was actually to predict, I think it was three missing elements just like Mendeley was able to do. Yeah, and then he went and fought in World War I and got killed. Why? Why, 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 why? So we're going to lose the valence electrons here. I want you to be able to take any element and tell me which valence electrons it's going to lose and what the resulting charge would be. So we lose two valence electrons, so that would be calcium with a 2 plus charge, right? So we'll end up with argon and an empty 4s, which is just argon. So calcium with a plus 2 charge and potassium with a plus 1 charge have exactly the same electron configuration. <gasps> Ooh, let's complicate it a little more. Let's move over to the right on the periodic table and do P-block metals. All right, category, category number two are P-block. All right, this is groups 3A to, although there won't be any 8A, those are your noble gases. So your metals here, and I'm going to include metalloids acting as metals. So if it acts as a metal, there'll be trends. Now, we're going to find out almost all of them have a couple options. They have preferred options, but it really depends what they're reacting with, right? Is this metal reacting with something that really, really loves to take electrons, right? Oh, it's a really strong oxidizing agent, so it'll tend to give you the higher charge. If it's reacting something that's a very weak oxidizing agent and doesn't take a lot of extra, uh, electrons, it might form the lower charge. 
right? So it really depends. You can't say which one is going to charge just by look, which, which ion is it going to form just by looking at it. You have to know what it's reacting with. But at least here we can predict both possibilities, all right? And there's only going to be two possibilities, except for aluminum. Aluminum, we treat a lot like we would just a traditional S block one, even though it's got a P block electron. It will always lose all of its electrons, right? So aluminum always goes plus three. Right, so it's going to lose its 1p electron and its, two, and its uh, two s electrons, right? So it's got uh, the, the, the s orbital is full with two, p orbital has one, it always loses all three. Um, and that's something we predicted later, before when we did nomenclature. Remember, we looked at type 1 versus type 2 metals. Type 1 metals, where your alkali metal is always plus 1, alkaline earth metal is always plus 2, we learned why. Uh, aluminum was always a plus 3, this is why, because it loses all of its valence electrons, both p and s block. Um, and then cadmium, zinc, silver, uh, those were some exceptions we'll actually look at when we do transition metals. Hey, hey, so all other P-block metals are going to have two possibilities. If you look at them, they have P-block electro valence electrons and S-block valence electrons. Oh, so the first type, the p-block electrons are further out. Remember, the s orbitals have more orbital penetration, and they shield out the p orbitals a little bit better because those little extra, remember, they had the extra little humps closer to the nucleus. So the p sublevel is higher energy than the s sublevel. So those go first, right? So these are further out. So like the 2P is further out than the 2S. The 5P is further out than the 5S. So the P ones will always peel off. You gotta peel off the onion layer first. So peel off the first layer first. That exposes the S orbital, which can then be removed as well. So ideally it will lose all of them. Preferably it will lose all of them, right? So this is a little more preferred because it becomes like the prior noble gas. Oh, all right. Um, but if it's acting with a weak oxi ox reacting with a weak oxidizing agent, you might just lose the p uh, subshell electrons possible. Let's look at a couple examples so you can see the elect the orbital box diagrams. All right, I'll do indium for you, and then you can do I'll do another one, maybe tin or lead or something like that on your own, and see if we get the same answer. So for p block metals again, we can lose the. Um, the P sublevel first, and then possibly the S as well, but you always lose the P first. Okay? So here's neutral indium. So if you do indium, find indium, that's number four to nine, right? Indium's number five, I can't see backwards, my friends. There we go, number 49 right there. Okay, so the prior noble gas would be krypton. Okay, that's why I have krypton as a noble gas. And then we go down one, two, three, four, five, so indium's over there in the fifth. So we're going to have uh, krypton 5s2, 4010, 5p1. Pretty easy, right? There's our 5s2, 4010. So the 5s is filled, the 4d, which is an inner shell, right? Because normally, if, if it's a full d, it, it ain't, it's an inner shell. It's not a valence shell, right? It's not involved in the chemistry. And then we got one electron in the 5p, just kind of dangling there. So the first ion possibility is we pop off that electron right there. Bye-bye. Because it's the furthest one out, it's the highest energy. It's the, you know, it's like uh, nature's pretty brutal. A lion's going to attack an antelope herd. You know, if I'm the lion, I'm going to go, hmm, look at that really old one with the with the bad knee or I don't even know if they have knees <laughs> sorry <laughs> if I don't know my anatomy of antelopes but it's kind of limping in the back of the pack that'd be an easy kill or should I go for the strongest one with the big sharp horns right in the middle and I got to get through 30 of them to get to I'm going to go for the one that requires the least amount of energy <laughs> take out that one that's you know limping behind right or a juicy little young one that got lost from the herd that's what the lion's gonna do right so that's the the furthest one out takes the least amount of energy to grab that one, right? So that one goes first. So that gives you ion option number one, where you have indium plus one. It lost one electron. Didn't touch the 5S, didn't touch the 4D, but we lost the one on the 5P, so that's the electron configuration for indium plus one, right? 
Well, if you're reacting with a strong oxidizing agent that loves taking electrons, and this would be more preferred is indium plus three, because you lose all the valence electrons, you'd lose the 5p as well as the 5s. Right? So if we remove those, we end up getting indium with a plus three charge. Do you see that? So you lose the 5p and the 5s. So the 5s is empty. The 5p is empty. The 4d is filled. So it's not quite krypton. It's krypton with a filled 4d. So they call that a pseudo, a pseudo. It's not quite there, but it's pretty, pretty not too bad. A pseudo noble gas electron configuration. And that gives you a plus three charge. And that is the second ion. Oh, let's do another one. Why don't you guys do 10 for me? Let's do, well, let me look at my peroctate. Let's do, oh, 10 right next to indium. That'll be boring, right? So lead, there's some F orbitals in there. Let's go ahead and do lead just for kicks and giggles. Let's do lead. Lead's going to be fun because we got the dumb F orbitals in there. So lead's way down here at number 82, right? So look at the prior uh, noble gases, xenon, right? So I put xenon there. And then we've got the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6s2. Notice the star. Boom, 4F14. And back to the 5D10 and the 6P2. Oh, hopefully those are getting easier for you. This is where orbital box diagrams start to not be a lot of fun. It's all those stupid Fs. <laughs> so what I want you to do is predict the two ions. I want you to pause it, predict the two ions. Remember, you're losing the P first. And these you lose second. So can you see you're going to get a plus two option or a plus two? four option, plus two or plus four. The plus four would give you kind of a pseudo noble gas electron configuration. But if you want, you don't need to do the orbital box diagram next. Uh, you can just write it, because uh, we can see the orbital box diagram. You can see where they're being lost pretty easily. So if you want to write the answer as a uh, noble gas core condensed SPDF notation, that might be a little bit easier. But would you all agree we lose those first? So we're going to get a lead plus two. Some of you know that. So, And the same thing would be true. Anything in that around the same thing there, right? So lead, tin, right? Tin. Whoa, one of those weird ones. What's that? Fluorovium. You kind of predict the same chemical. Even if you don't know it, you could predict it. So let's do this. Let's go xenon, 6s2, 4f14, 5d10. How do you like them apples? Is that better? What was that? That was that, uh, how do you like them? Where did I get? Goodwill Hunting? Was that from Goodwill Hunting? Quoting movies! All right, so you just lost the 6P, and it gives you a 2 plus charge. So that's ion number one. Let's look at ion number two. We're going to lose the 6P and the 6S. So that would be a lead four or plumus and plumbic if you go the old latin system there so we lose the 6s so you're going to have the xenon the 6s2 is gone so you're just left with the pseudo noble gas and you're off to the races ion number two there you go. You can now do P-block. The only one that doesn't follow this is aluminum. Aluminum will always lose this, the, uh, I think it's the 3P and the 3S, so it's always a plus 3. All the other ones have the two possibilities. There you go. Let's do nonmetals. Those are easy. All right, gang, nonmetals are a piece of cake, right? Because they're further over to the right, right? So they're closer to the next noble gas. So instead of losing all these electrons to become a cation and losing like, you know, four, five, six, 10, 15 electrons, forget that. It takes more energy each time you lose an electron. It's easier to gain them and go this direction. So they want to be isoelectronic with the next noble gas, which means they need to gain enough electrons to complete their P subshell, that valence shell. And again, the goal is to have a full valence shell. 
right? Mm -hmm. Which would make it isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. So I didn't talk about valence shells and that stuff before because we hadn't done electron configurations. So I just said it wants to have the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. This is why. Let's do a couple examples real quick. All right, we like the nonmetals, right? So let's do selenium. So find selenium. That's number 34 right there. So obviously the prior noble gas to selenium is argon. So do argon in brackets and then 4s, 3d, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 electrons in the 4p. So it's argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. That's for neutral selenium. Now, if you look at it, if we try to follow like a metal, it would have to lose all four of these and two. So losing four is hard enough. Losing six, right? It'd have to be a plus six. Forget that. That takes weight. It's like, heck with that. Way too much energy. I'd rather just pick up two electrons, right? If it picked up two electrons, it would complete its outer shell and become like the next noble gas, which is krypton right there so it wants to become krypton so if we pick up two it forms a minus two charge whoops i should probably do the i on there so let's write selenium with a two minus charge and we only get one option right metals you can get two in a lot of situations but not metals you only get one option right? so we're going to have um this whole bunch of left so i'm going to write this out right so this would be argon, and I'm just going to write it in the SPDF, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, which is krypton. Yay, so pop two electrons in there. Easy. So do chlorine for me. See if you can do that on your own. Give me the neutral, this the regular neutral element, and then predict its ion charge and write its electron configuration for chlorine. Hopefully chlorine was easy for you. So neutral chlorine, of course. Chlorine's number 17 right here, right? So it's going to have neon as its noble gas with a 3s2, 3p5. Right there. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yep, that's exactly right. So 3s2, 3p5, no d orbitals in here. And that doesn't come until later. One away, right? Trying to lose all of those? No way. It doesn't want to go seven plus. It'd rather just go minus one. So one more electron to fill that valence shell. It's one away to become isoelectronic with the next noble gas. So chloride ion would be neon. The 3s is fine, but we fill the 3p shell. I did that in red. We pop that extra electron in there. Don't worry about where that comes from for right now. But that's the same as the next noble gas from chlorine, which is argon. Right on. Easy. Let's do a little intro to transition metals. It's not perfect. It's only, what I'm going to teach you only allows you to predict two possibilities. There's a lot of exceptions to it. Some of them can do three, four, sometimes five different uh, uh, ions. So there's more to it than what I'm talking about. Depends what it's reacting with. Is it a solution? Is it not? I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors involved. But let's just show you, like, why can iron be a plus? Some of you know iron from biology is a plus two or a plus three. Well, let's look at why plus two or plus three, and then we'll do another option maybe. But let me show you the rules, general rules for this, right? For transition metals, the idea is similar to the p-block metals, where remember with p-block metals, we had two options, lose the outermost p valence electrons first, and then you can lose those and the s-block, but you had to peel off the p-block to get to the underlying s-block, right? Same thing's true with transition metals, but you're not looking at S and P, you're looking at S and D block, right? So the general electron configuration is you're going to have some principal energy level, say N equals 4, and you'll have either one or two electrons in that S block, depending if it's like copper or chromium with those exceptions, or silver or something. Well, those are your outer electrons, that'd be like the 4S. And then this would be the N minus 1, so if this is 4S, that'd be 3D. If it's 5S, it's 4D. So these D electrons are the inner electrons. They're closer to the nucleus, right? So you have to peel off the S ones before you can get to the Ds. So the first ion option is you lose the S block valence electrons. Then that'll be one or two. 
So most of the transition metals can form a plus one or a plus two, depending if how their original electron configuration is. Most of them are plus two. Well, if it's reacting with something that's a strong oxidizing agent, loves taking electrons, the transition metal, which much more likely lose the S block and some of the D block electrons, much preferred, right? Because what it wants to do is stabilize its D block. And a stable D block would be empty or half filled, right? It likes the symmetry. It likes a symmetric electron uh, distribution within that block. So full, half filled, or empty are the preferable options for D block. But if you're losing electrons, full is not going to be an option. So if it's more than half filled, it will lose enough to get half filled. If it's less than half filled, it will lose enough to become empty after it loses its S block electrons. You have to lose the S block electrons first. Get it? Got it good? Let's do some examples. Let's look at iron, my friends. So iron man, iron man, 26 right there. So the prior noble gas would be argon right there. And then you've got the four, one, two, three, four S2, three D, one, two, three, four, five, six. Four S2, three D, six, boom, 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 following Hunt's rule. So take a look at the, the configuration, right? Pretty happy here, although you see that one extra one there? Nyeh, it would love to be half filled, but it can't get to that 3D electron because it's an inner light. The 4S is here, the 3D is here. Even though the 4S has a little bit of orbital penetration and fills first, the majority of the electron density is further out than the 3D. So 3D is closer in general to the nucleus. So you can't remove that 3D electron until you remove the 4S first. Got to peel out the, the onion layer, right? So the first iron uh, ion, you're going to lose the, both of these 4S electrons first. Got to get rid of those. Now we'll give you an iron two. So we empty out the 4S and we have not touched the 3D subshell yet. So that would be if it reacts with like a weak oxidizing agent that doesn't like to take a lot of electrons. But if the iron reacts with something that's a stronger oxidizing agent and loves electrons, it'll peel off the 4S and that 3D electron right there. Because if you get rid of that one, so you lose the 2S, the, the two 4S electrons and the 3D, so you lose three totally, get a plus three charge. So the 4S is empty. Now the 3D is half filled. That's more stable. It's more symmetric. Now, I guess if we list all of those, you can you have an iron plus eight, but that's that takes way too much energy to empty this out. So it's going to stay half filled. So that's why iron's a plus two or a plus three. It would pr probably prefer to be a plus three. All right? Let's do one more. I'm going to let you do the next one and predict the two possible transition metal charges. All right, my friend, what I want you to do, imagine this is an exam, and I say, hey, what are the preferred ionic charges for the element yttrium? So what you do is you look at it and realize, well, first it takes you 10 minutes to find it, and you go, oh, it's right there. What a weird name. That's in the transition metal block, the D block. So we're going to have two options, except for silver, cadmium, zinc, I think, where they only have one. And if you, you could try them and see why they would only have one particular charge. It's based on the electron configuration. They have full D blocks. <laughs> so let's look at number 39. What is the noble gas prior to that? Looks like krypton. So let's do krypton 5s241. Right, so that's going to be krypton 5s2. Four D one five S two four D one. There's the neutral atom yttrium. Well, remember, it would love to empty out its D shell, have it more symmetric, right? Empty or half filled, but it can't get rid of that because the five S is further out. So we gotta lose these first, right? Pause this and do it on your own if you can. So that's going to give us a plus two. That's not the one it wants. It really wants to lose that one as well, all right? But you got to get rid of that. So if it's reacting with a weak oxidizing agent, this might be one of your possibilities. The 5S empties out. The 
start to get to do these electron configurations pretty fast, don't you? All right, so this is less preferred. And then what it'll do is lose this next. And that will get the 4D shell empty. Do you see that? So that will give us yttrium 3 plus. Definitely its preferred scenario, which would be krypton. And this empties out, which means it has a preferred noble gas electron configuration. So the, the, the transition metals that are early on here, they can peel off the S and the D and become isoelectronic with the next noble gas. That's very, very, very stable. So that's the preferred. And pretty much in real life, you're mostly only going to see yttrium and these other ones here, scandium and stuff in the plus three state. It's, it's by far, that's so easy to lose that one particular electron. And there you go. Practice away, my friends.